So good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's virtual meeting for the Human Rights and Relations Commission for the Town of Wethersfield. Tonight is March 9th, 2022, um, and it is 7.04 p.m. And we will get started with um, seeing who's in attendance and the meeting is being recorded. So right now, just to make sure I'm not missing anyone, I have Alex, I have Barbara, I have Maria, I have Carolyn, I have Deborah, and I have Yvette for members. Is that accurate or am I, or did I miss anybody? Perfect. And then we have two um, guests, Myra and James. And anybody else that I'm missing? All right, wonderful. It's all yours, Deb. Okay. Um, just a point that has nothing to do with this meeting, but can any of you actually see me? No. No. Okay. So it's a computer glitch on my end. I'll just look into it later. Thank you very much. We can um, hear you crystal clear. So that's a good Okay. Thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the first thing... Um, on our agenda is an appro is approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Did everyone get a chance to see them? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, any questions, concerns, or anything about the um, minutes before we move to approve them? Nothing on my end. Nope. Okay. Um, someone like to move to approve them? Mm -hmm. I move to approve uh, the minutes from the last meeting. All in, all in favor? I just need a second. You need a second. I'll second. What? Oh, Alex did it. We just needed a second. Yeah. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. And we had all in favor, was that? <clears throat> I'm going to abstain because I wasn't at the last meeting. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, we have yes, two guests yes. with us tonight. Um, Myra Clark Siegel and Jay, Jay Tulin. Jay, do you usually go by James? Jay. My, okay. my given name is James, but I go by Jay. I was okay. going to correct Erica, but she was oh, nice okay. enough to send me the link again this afternoon. So. <laughs> Okay. I didn't know okay. I was going to do that. I will mark you down as Jay, I promise. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, actually, um, Myra is here to speak briefly with us about um, a resolution that I shared with everyone in an email about our commission adopting um, a resolution to accept um, a definition um, that she will tell us more about. This came to my attention through Jay. Um, so he, I'm sure he will also want to add a few words about that. Which one of you would like to start? <laughs> oh, looks like it's Myra. Okay. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, everybody. And 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 uh, special thank you also to Maria Alfonso, whom uh, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking with at a prior briefing um, that Jay actually had organized for chairs of human rights commissions um, in Connecticut. So I thought, if it's okay with you all, first of all, I'm going to see timing. How long do you want me to speak for and then have some q and I just want to be very mindful of your time and, uh, you know, do whatever is amenable to you all. Um, I was thinking 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'm right, sure right. there will be questions for you. Okay. And, you know, I'll try to save you some time even within that. We'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, so, you know, I want to, first of all, again, thank you all and thank Jay uh, for really bringing this opportunity to have this important conversation about anti-Semitism together. Um, my name is Myra Clark Siegel, and I'm the regional director for AJC Westchester Fairfield, but our name is a little bit of a misnomer because we actually work throughout Connecticut. AJC, just as a little bit of background for you, is uh, American Jewish Committee. And we are the oldest Jewish civil rights organization in the United States. We were founded in 1906 
And part of what we were founded on literally the day that we were founded uh, continues through our work every single day, um, including and until today. And that is ensuring civil rights and human rights for everyone. And part of that is also combating anti-Semitism. And that is really one of the hallmarks, I think, of AJC's work. It's our interfaith and our intergroup work that we do. We are very proud of our interfaith and our intergroup work. We are nonpartisan. We are fiercely nonpartisan because we believe that the issues that we work on are too important to be attached to any one political party or ideology. And I just wanna mention a few examples of our interfaith and intergroup work, just to give you a sense of the scope. We have uh, a um, formal partnership with many, many organizations, interfaith and intergroup organizations, and we have official um, a Muslim Jewish advisory council, a Latino Jewish leadership advisory council. Um, we have an entire institute for Asian American Pacific Islander focus. In fact, we have stood out very strongly and uh, proudly in terms of addressing the issue of Uyghurs in China and the, the horrific experiences that the Uyghurs are, are facing in China. With the Black community, we uh, helped launch the Black Jewish um, Congressional Caucus, both in the U.S. House and in the U.S. Senate. We have a formal partnership with the National Urban League and with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And these are just a few examples. And the other thing that also sets AJC apart from any other organization is our diplomatic outreach. And I want to just mention, as Ukraine is in our hearts and minds, and everyone who's innocent civilians in this situation, AJC was the first and in fact the only Jewish organization that called for Ukraine's renewed independence in 1991. And we have worked extremely closely with Ukraine ever since. Um, and so, you know, I know again that we are all very focused on that, but I'm very proud of the work that we at AJC have been doing uh, literally constantly since 1991 with Ukraine. And the issues that I wanted to speak with you about this evening are the issues of anti-Semitism. In fact, as you look at what is happening in Ukraine and you listen to what Putin is saying, his justification of going into Ukraine, his, his incursion into Ukraine was ostensibly the anti-Nazification of Ukraine. And I think that it's really important that we talk about these issues. Um, if you look at headlines from today alone in New York City, New York City reported that anti-Semitic crime jumped 400% in the month of February alone. And the month before that, it jumped by 300%. So these are not just things that are happening over there. These are things here in each of our communities, in our own backyards and across the country. And so, you know, if we kind of take a look back and we think about Coleyville, and again, our eyes were all on what was happening at the synagogue in Coleyville in Texas uh, just a couple months ago. Those were really a stark reminder of what American Jews are facing. If you think about the fact that people were simply at worship and then they were under assault because it was a Jewish house of worship. If you think about the insurrection in the Capitol on January 6th and you saw people wearing sweatshirts that said 6MWNE mm -hmm. on them. Six million was not enough. These are some examples of what Jewish Americans are dealing with on a regular basis. And I wanna pull back even further a little bit to 2018 because the Pittsburgh attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue was a wake up call for American Jews. And we at AJC wanted to look at this was that at the time an anomaly, which was the worst attack against Jews on American soil in history, or was it a sign of what was really happening here in this country? So we undertook a survey and it was the largest survey of the American Jewish um, population. And since then in the subsequent two years, we have undertaken two subsequent uh, surveys with, two with a parallel component each year so that we have assessed what the American Jewish community are feeling, and then we assessed what the broader 
civil society feels in terms of or understands in, term, in terms of uh, anti-Semitism. And I thought I would just briefly mention some of the findings from these surveys and reports, the most recent one, which was in the fall, um, to share with you and to, to illustrate why this conversation about anti-Semitism is so important. And then to talk a little bit about what we can do together. And part of that is uh, our request is, as you saw the language already, to adopt um, the uh, IRA or International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. So I'm just gonna share a few highlights because I think that they're really important and they, they're really illustrative of what truly is going on across every community um, in the United States. So we asked American Jews and again, the general American public, um, how much of a problem they believe anti-Semitism is in America today. And the differences between the two demographic groups were pretty striking. 90% of American Jews, fully nine and 10, think that anti-Semitism is a problem in the United States today. But if you look at general society responses, only six in 10 believe that anti-Semitism is a problem in the United States today. And a full quarter of the American public believe that anti-Semitism is not a problem in the United States. And I think that that, again, points to a vastly different understanding of the threats that American Jews have been facing across the US. We also asked people if they believe that anti-Semitism has increased, decreased, or stayed the same over the last five years. And again, the last five years has included the, the Pittsburgh attack, um, and it has included Poway, and it has included attacks in Muncie, it has included attacks in Los Angeles, it has included attacks in Chicago, it has included attacks here in, the, in our region, in New York and in Connecticut here. Um, it has included swastikas at schools, at places of worship, at restaurants, and the list goes on and on. And so I want to share those findings with you. Eight in 10 American Jews, in fact, 82% report that they believe that anti-Semitism has increased in the last five years. But if you look at the American general public, only four in 10 in the American public believes that anti-Semitism has increased in the past five years. And in fact, the general public was five times more likely to believe that anti-Semitism has decreased in the last five years. And I'll, I'll stop after this next point, which is that one in four American Jews has been the target of anti-Semitism over the last 12 months. And as a result of all of the things that I've just mentioned to you, American Jews are changing their behavior out of fear of anti-Semitism. So in the last year alone, nearly four in 10 American Jews have avoided doing at least one of the following three things, if not all of them, which is they have avoided publicly wearing, carrying, or displaying <clears throat> things that would help people identify them as Jewish. So that might mean they wouldn't wear a t-shirt that has writing on it in Hebrew, or they won't wear a Star of David necklace, or a religious male Jew won't wear a yarmulke, which is a sign of respect for religious Jews. That's one example. They've avoided certain places or events or situations out of concern for their safety or comfort as a Jew. And they've avoided posting content online that would identify them as Jewish or sympathetic to Jewish causes. And again, these are just some examples of what American Jews have been facing over the past number of years. And that's important to note, but what's also important to discuss, and again, what we're here to ask you all to help support is action. And the reason that we're asking you to adopt the IRA anti-Semitism working definition is that this is a working definition that was drafted by absolute experts, uh, global experts on the issue of anti-Semitism. The reason that we believe that it's important is because if you have a definition, then you can address it and you can measure it. And when you can measure it, you can utilize tools to really address it and turn the tide. And so the working definition of anti-Semitism is not legally binding in any way, shape or form. I wanna really underscore that point. It is a definition. 
but it is a guide, it is a tool to allow government, to allow law enforcement, to allow civil society leaders like yourselves to be able to have a guide as to some examples of anti-Semitism, a definition of it, so that we can ensure that our communities are safe and that our communities are stronger together. And that is why we're asking you to do that. So I'll stop here and see if you have any questions and uh, see how either Jay or I can answer you know, any questions you have or provide any resources for you. Um, before, we, um, before we go to questions, um, Jay, is there something that you would like to add to what Myra has shared? Uh, well, <clears throat> she's really the brains of the operation. <laughs> you know, she's, she's the presenter. I am not a presenter. What I would like to share is um, just a little historical perspective, if this is helpful at all, of how this got to this point with me and with Myra and bring it to you folks. Uh, Myra was invited to the Farmington Human Relations Commission meeting. I'll make this brief. She, she was invited to speak to us about the state of anti-Semitism before the uh, Farmington Human Relations Commission, or actually I think it was the town council around a year or so ago. And she talked about this International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition, which I have to confess, I really didn't know what that was. I hadn't heard of it before. And I will say it really struck a nerve for me. So I did a little bit of research, uh, reached out to Myra, who has been you know, willing to, I guess, do this tour of towns that we're doing, that we're doing. So it, really, it struck a nerve with me. We, you know, we did talk. And um, as you know, Maria, Deborah, and a few other of you uh, from, that were at that collaborative meeting, which is a group of, I think, 15 towns that have similar commissions that we've met three or four times now, um, was, was also willing to move this forward. So we've gone to, I think this is the seventh or eighth town. A few of the towns have adopted it. I know a few are bringing it to their town council to do, you know, for the town council to adopt it, even though it's not, it's not legal. I don't know if you said this or not, but I'll add it. It's a, it's a non-binding definition, uh, which is a really important point for you. You know, so, I mean, really all I want to say is I just, I, I really appreciate Myra being willing to go to all the towns and speak about this. Um, as eloquently as she does, and towns and folks like yourselves, you know, agreeing to allow us to come and speak with you. I think this is a really important thing. Again, it really struck a nerve for me, also being Jewish, you know, um, and, uh, and also, you know, being on a human relations commission is not this okay. hatred or any, any acts like this at all. Obviously, are something that I am hoping that, uh, you know, our fellow commissions and towns will really strongly consider moving forward. And just thank you for giving me a couple of minutes to talk. Thank you, Jay. Um, is there anybody on this call who did not receive a copy of the definition that we are discussing tonight? Is there, is there a need to put it up on a side screen, which I don't know how to do? <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone okay with talking about this based on the email I sent out? You're not alone not knowing how to do that, Deborah. Yeah. <laughs> Deb, I can try to pull up your email. Just give me a minute. Okay. Um, Eric, while while you're doing that, I was just going to mention that this is not just a municipal endeavor. Um, over 30 <clears throat> countries uh, have adopted the IRA working definition already. Uh, including in Europe. And if you think about, you know, the, the significant rise of anti-Semitism across <clears throat> Europe and many, many European countries have adopted it. And the US administrations, both Democratic and Republican have been uh, utilizing the working definition as well, both in the State Department and Education Departments, et cetera. So I just wanna show, you know, just so that you all know and numerous municipalities across the country and states here have also adopted this working definition. So this is not just Jay and me coming to, you know, to Weathersfield to ask you all to adopt it. This is something that has been robustly adopted because it is seen as a very important tool in terms of combating anti-Semitism. Understood, thank you. Maria, 
you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank uh, Ms. Myra for coming and presenting on this yes. and Jay for making us aware. Um, and thanks to Deborah and Carolyn who were both on the meeting at which we attended for several, you know, for the various human rights commissions. This, I'm a, I'm a supporter of the definition because if you have a definition, you know what you're looking at. Because many times things happen and you don't know what it is. It just feels wrong in your gut, but you don't know what it is. And if you have a definition that helps put words to what that is, that just feels morally wrong. And, yeah. and be able to address it when you confront it. And anti-Semitism is the thing that is, you can't see it, but you know. You, I can't, it's one of the things you feel it, but a definition makes it more helpful to understand. And um, in recent events, I'm gonna just use the situation, or I should say the invasion of Russia by Ukra in Ukraine. They, to a point of why definitions are important. Um, one of the primary CNN reporters, I think it's Akosta, was interviewing, I think the head um, rabbi for either Kiev or Ukraine. And I, I can't remember which one he was. And he was interviewed about the President Zelensky. And the reporter said something essentially, well, why are they talking about me? denazification as a justification for the invasion when you have a Jewish president and the rabbi immediately corrected the reporter, the American reporter and said, no, he's a, the Ukrainian president of all Ukrainians who happens to be Jewish. Now, I don't believe that the reporter intended in any way to be offensive, but that distinction I got immediately, which is to present him as a Jewish president, as opposed to the president of his country, allows Nazi factions, which exist unfortunately in Russia as well, to use that in a campaign against the country by saying they have a Jewish leader. And I don't think it's coincidence that in the multiple bombings that the Russians did, they made it a point of bombing, I think it's the only Holocaust memorial that they finally spent millions of dollars with a lot of effort to build in Kiev. It got bombed. Of all the targets, I don't think that was coincidental. So to have a walking, working definition of anti-Semitism helps you understand what, what words mean, what they don't mean, how they're used in imagery in every, conceivable way. So that just reminded me of why definitions are helpful for people to understand. I also appreciate uh, Myra talking to me because I had one clarity on some of the language with that of the definition that basically talks to criticisms of Israeli policies. Um, because I have disagreements, strong disagreements on certain Israeli policies, but I can make the distinction between a policy mm -hmm. and how that can be used by some to attack Jewish communities throughout the world. And you can't, you know, the notion of you make a person, a whole community responsible for the decisions of decision makers in a set time, in a set place, in a set country. That feeds into that narrative. Um, so I wanted to say thank you very much for addressing that because that is also forms of anti-Semitism. You use something else that's a legitimate criticism to basically attack a group of people, just like you choose to point out that the president of Ukraine happens to be Jewish. Why do we care? I mean, I respect his pride of his heritage and I believe, unfortunately, he had many relatives who died during the Holocaust, but that doesn't um, give, you can't use that as an excuse for other intentions. And I sadly, I think that in the case of Putin, he is using anti-Semitism for personal effect because historically Soviet Union, what used to be the Soviet Union, which included Ukraine and Russia, had a lot of anti-Semitism. And I can say that from having the pleasure of having one of my grad professors, Professor Yofi, who was a famous dissident 
he didn't, even though he never viewed himself that way, he was able to get out because of the international pressure. And his crime, if you will, was basically he was an intellectual who happened to be Jewish in the time that you couldn't be both in the Soviet Union. So thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, Yvette, it looks like you have your hand up as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, Myra, I was wondering if you could just provide some insight. I'm just curious on what would be the pushback that you hear from whether it's other towns or other commissions that don't want to adopt this definition and, and what is the reasoning behind that? Can you just share a little insight in, into that? Sure, of course. Um, we have not found so far, I mean, you know, this is a pretty new initiative in terms of talking to um, communities and, and town councils in terms of the IRA working definition here in Westchester Fairfield, um, or I'll say Connecticut, because really it's all of Connecticut that we're working with. So we have not really found pushback um, in terms of adoption. And I think that really it's just each municipality has its own process. In some cases, a municipality may uh, adopt it by executive order of the mayor or the first selectman or the town supervisor. In other cases, the Human Rights Commission wants to look at it first and then wants to take it to the town council, et cetera. So I really think that it's much more about each community's process rather than pushback or anyone saying that they don't want to adopt it. It's okay, a great question. You. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Are there more questions for Myra? Um, Deb, I just wanted, is this, can you guys see the email I just put up? Is this what you're referring to, Deb? But you yeah, the, the, okay. the, um, the, the item in number three, I think, okay. is the correct one. So Myra, I have a question for you. Sure. <clears throat> because I always like to push things a little bit further down the road than than, than the pace at which they're going. Um, I'm definitely in favor of, of us supporting this, but in your view, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. um, and I will say with all due respect, I've really been thinking about this a lot and I do not mean to, um, I don't mean to offend any effort that any individual or group makes towards making things better, but beyond the rallies and beyond the vigils and beyond the resolutions, I think that we need to take further steps to actually do something. So could you share your vision for where we would go after this? Um, thank you for raising that question. Uh, it's, it's a really important one. So I will tell you that a couple of years ago, so there, there are a few things. This is a step, it's an important step, but if it is a piece of paper on a shelf, it doesn't do much good. So then one of the things that I think is really important is to also be training government officials in law enforcement, for example, um, and the DA's office, et cetera, on these issues so that they have an understanding of what it is. Um, earlier this year, or in 2021, I should say, uh, the US Congress passed the No Hate Act, which was a really, really, um, it was called the Jabara Hire um, Act. And this is a piece of legislation that AJC was very, very involved in supporting. Why am I raising this? Because the No Hate Act was designed to provide federal funds to states to be able to do training for law enforcement and government officials to be able to track hate crimes, and that's part of it. Oh. But, but part of that means that that training has to happen. And part of what we are doing actually literally next week is um, we have funding from the Department of Homeland Security. We are doing training literally next week. It's called Tackle. And uh, it is about tackling bias, tackling racism, tackling Islamophobia, tackling anti-Semitism for government officials, for law enforcement officials, et cetera. So we have a three-part training that we are doing with professionals, actually from a partner organization, a Muslim organization that we work with called Mufalhun. 
to really do this training. Um, and, and it is a six hour training where people will receive accreditation for that training. It is very formal, very official training. And I think that that's really important. So I would say one thing is um, that if there's an official from Weathersfield that you think you, know, you would wanna recommend to participate, I might be able to still get them in to do this training. If not, we can try to get them in a future cohort. Because again, you have to know what you're dealing with and be able to know how to report hate crimes, whether they're racially motivated or religiously motivated hate crimes. So that's important. And again, the No Hate Act is important because it provides funding to do that. Perfect, wow, you guys are way ahead of me. I don't have to screen share. Um, <laughs> and, and another part of it, again, is providing this kind of information. You know, I can provide this briefing for you know, for your officials, for your town council, for others, because again, I think that it's really important that we raise awareness about these issues. We are, uh, one of the other things, and then I'll stop there, is first of all, um, we have uh, launched at uh, AJC's national level, and then here in our regional level, we launched last spring, a community of conscience. And it is an interfaith, intergroup, uh, working group, essentially, of people working together from every different faith and background so that we stand up for and with each other. This is not just, the community of conscience is not just focused on the Jewish community. It means that when there have been attacks against the Asian American Pacific Islander community, we are standing there, we are putting out statements, we are standing literally shoulder to shoulder with our friends and our community partners. The same with the Muslim community and so on. This is some of the different actions that we can take. So it's training, it's raising awareness, and it's public statements of support when these situations happen. And I hope that those are some helpful examples of things that we can do to you know, be active upstanders for our community partners. Thank you. And it sounds like this commission may want to have some conversation um, not necessarily at tonight's meeting, but going forward about um, whether or not we feel the need to bring this to our um, town leaders, to our police department or whoever that may be. Mm -hmm. um, and if it looks like that's something we would like to pursue, we would definitely reach out to you. Great, so, happy, so. happy to be a resource in any way. Thank you. More questions, more conversation, comments? Objections, anything, now is the time. I think in terms of our police department, this is perfect timing because we have a brand new police chief. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there have been some problems within the department on a whole variety of levels um, that I have a feeling he may be addressing. So Barbara, is it your thought that he should be contacted about the upcoming training or should we? I think we should share the information with him about future trainings. I think he's got a lot on his plate right now. I agree, but I'm glad that you mentioned that. Well, you know, it's, it's very interesting because today I believe the Congress passed the Emmett Till Act. Mm -hmm. It took 122 years to make lynching a federal crime. Can you believe that? Okay. Thank so, you for raising that because it's so important that, that you know, justice is finally gonna be served. Well, there's an interesting, um, there's a deacon in Hartford, a Roman Catholic deacon by the name of Miller, I can't think of his first name. And he wrote, he grew up with Emmett Hill in Chicago. Arthur Miller. Arthur That's Miller, thank you. I, I've met him before. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing man. And it, it's a, it's a really, it's a very thin book. I can't remember exactly what it, what the title of it is, but it was extremely moving. And, um, you know, hate comes on many levels. Right. So how do we feel as a commission this evening about taking a vote on this? Is this something that we want to act on now? 
think it I think the language is fairly straightforward. It's fairly plain. It's fairly specific. And I think one of the things that the attacks on the house on the on the synagogues has done for all houses of worship, it has made us wary. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had a quick question. Maybe this question is more for Erica. So what would the next step in our process be? Do we adopt this or do we recommend it to the town council to adopt? What is, what is our next step? Um, if we want to pursue it with the town council, we would bring it to town council. I believe as a group, if we wanted to, as a commission, if we wanted to <clears throat> a motion and vote on this um, as a group, we could do that as well. And then if we wanted to bring it forward, we would have to, you know, obviously bring it to town council. Right. Would, it, would it be possible for us to sign on to this and then um, sort of make an announcement about it at town council and say, we hope we're all united in this? I know that our mayor has signed on to something similar. Yeah, they've done a couple things over the years similar to this. What I can tell you, I know if you guys, I know you guys probably want to make a motion and vote on it, but I can ask about it tomorrow and get an email out to say like officially what we can do for um, as a group, or we can do a vote and then see see exactly how you know best to pursue it. Well, my suggestion would be if we vote on this and adopt it. What we could do is we could send an email to each member of the town council saying that the commission has has done some research, we've looked into this, we've adopted it, and we'd like the town to consider it. We'd like the council to consider it. And because what that does is it informally brings it before them rather than an immediate public way, so that if we formally go to the town council, we've already educated them. That think that's a, a reasonable way of approaching it. And I think it also means that um, we skip the step of perhaps seeming like we're asking for permission. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a whole other issue. But anyway, um, is everybody here comfortable with taking a vote on this this evening or are there any objections and I can't see the full screen of everybody's faces so rather than raising hands if people would just jump in that would be great well this I'm is for taking oh this is Barbara I, I just find I, I mean don't take this the wrong way it it's an it's important but the language is very straightforward. It's very non-judgmental. It's very calm. Does that make any sense, Maria? <laughs> well, if I were to ask for someone to make a motion that we as a commission adopted this statement, would there be someone to second that motion? I'd move it. I'd second it. Okay, so I will officially make a motion that we adopt this. Well, you don't have, you're the chair. You can't make the motion. You no. Oh, I don't want to be the chair anymore. <laughs> I want to make the <laughs> Too bad. So bad. Which is why I moved it and Maria seconded yeah. it because the chair Thank can't. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm with you 100%, Deborah. I can't move anything either as chair okay. of our commission. And it's very well, frustrating. It's very frustrating. Well, I forget because we haven't done anything like this in a while. Uh, so, am, is it okay if I ask um, for all in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Any nays? It's your problem, Cat. Any abstentions? Well, it looks like we have. Um, can I a, a clarification of what the actual motion you want? 
The motion was to move the definition that we would adopt the, the definition. And you'll have to fill in the part about who defined it because I don't have it up on my screen. Excuse me, I have to untangle a cat from yarn. <laughs> Do you guys mind if I share a couple of thoughts about this? Sure. I, 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 I didn't want to impose on your discussion because it really isn't my place to, but um, you did raise some good points. First of all, thank you for taking this action tonight. I'd also mm -hmm. say, and, and um, in a lot of the discussion in these in the collaborative of 15 uh, communities who are all run very differently, they all run very differently, and, and the processes are, are very different from town to town. My take on this, I'm only speaking for myself, my take on this is that what I'm, what I'm thinking, and again, I, I'm just talking for myself, is the reason why we, we decided to bring this to human relations commissions, human rights commissions, or like yours, human relations and rights, or rights and relations commission, Hamden also has that, is to do just what you're doing, to adopt this or endorse this, and then bring it forward to whatever, you know, whatever form of government you have, and, and let them take, you know, whatever formal action they want to do, which might be very different from town to town. So you've taken a, you've taken a, a huge first step to endorse this and presumably, you know, bring it forward to your town council to take whatever action they're going to do. I also would say, you know, putting something on a piece of paper is great. You know, some of the things Myra talked about, about possible future activities, you know, the training. I'm, and just so, for the record, I'm participating in that tackle training next week and a few of us. And Deborah, when you and I were talking the other day I, about some, some of the concerns that I raised in our conversation, and I kept on saying I'm forgetting something that I sent out to everybody. Yes. Tackle, what, tackle was the thing that I was forgetting, which I'm, okay. I'm, I shouldn't admit that in front of Myra, but it's true. <laughs> so I... <laughs> Because uh, that's another thing that I got from Myra and company from AJC. Anyway, so I just kind of, for whatever, for whatever that perspective is worth, um, you guys endorse, you folks endorsing it, and then bringing it forward to your town government is an excellent step, and I just really appreciate you doing that. Well, we're happy to do it, Jay. Thank you. Um, and I mean, the town council bring bring it forward to the town council. What? It doesn't become part of the town code. It doesn't become a law. It just sets a tone. Right. And, and you know, I think that the mayor periodically has done, has issued proclamations. It, it's it, it's that kind of a, a thing. And it's it's a form. It, it allows us to bring forward a conversation. I mean, I think that when when Coley, Texas <clears throat> happened, when the Tree of Life happened, you know, people started to talk. And now we need to start to talk again because of what's going on in Ukraine. Right. It's important well, that, we, that we have this discussion because I, I always am concerned that the communities who are affected directly self-censor for safety. And those of us who don't come from those communities have to work a little harder at it because we don't have that to contend with. And you don't want to put people in a situation they feel uncomfortable if they're trying to stay safe, but you can speak to the truth of what's going on on their behalf. And if they want to come forward and participate, that'll be up to them, but they don't have to. Um, because it's a very difficult conversation to have because if you come from a minority community, I don't care what you're from, in a country that has such diversity, you always have to be mindful of that and respect people's space and how safe they feel in the circumstance. And unfortunately, there have been too many instances of things happening to cause them to feel unsafe. Um, so I think this is awesome. And the more we spread the word on the definition, the better, so that people have something to look at when they're seeing or hearing something that just doesn't seem right or seems wrong because sometimes you don't know what it is unless someone helps you with a definition. Well, Jay and Myra, know. thank you both so much. I, I know uh, I'm not on your commission, but I'm going to do one other thing. 
that um, at some point in time, whenever this comes before your council, I would love to be on that call just to hear how that discussion goes. We'll keep you informed, Jay, I promise. Uh, well, you and I, I would, talk all I the time too. anyway, Deborah, right, so I'm, right. I'm sure. <laughs> right. But really, thanks to you and Myra for everything that you brought to this call. Um, if there is no further discussion about this, what I'd like to do is move on to the next thing on our agenda. We do have a, a, a few things. Is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I just want to say thank you um, for this step that you took. Um, it, it is an important step. It's an important <laughs> statement. And thank you for your leadership, all of you, and for all the work that you're doing. So. Thank you again. And again, you know, we're here as a resource for you in any way. So an email or a phone call away. Absolutely. So Good thank you. Thank you, well. you. thank you all. Be thank well. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye. Okay. Um, hold on. My computer's doing very weird things with me this evening on the Zoom call. Um, thank you all, by the way, for that. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention tonight, and I also put an email about, about this, was um, getting your feedback about how best to move forward with getting things on our agenda so that the concerns and ideas of everyone on this commission um, are really up front. And Alex, I think you had responded with a particular concern. And Erica, you were going to fill us in. Um, Alex, can you tell us what your uh, idea so, was? So I've been seeing and I'm hearing across the state there's been more towns with the homelessness and the panhandling at the corners. And, you know, people are complaining about it, but, you know, again, these are people that need help. And I think there's resources <clears throat> available that we can offer as a town just to help them if there's, you know, from what I'm hearing, the uh, guys across from Popeyes have some drug issues. And so I think we can offer them something. I know, I don't know, with leading them in the right direction. Hartford has been dealing with this issue extensively. Um, I participate on a fairly regular basis with one of the NRZs, um, Maple Avenue Revitalization Group, which is probably the premier NRZ in Hartford because it's, it's led by someone by the name of Hyacin Yanni. And Hyacin is, um, She's terrorized the entire government in the city of Hartford. <laughs> when the mayor and the police chief and everybody, anybody else she calls up, they show up at the meeting and they have to listen to her. Um, to some ex some of these people, it's a business, okay? It's a straight out business that, you know, they, they, bet, they panhandle and they don't pay taxes and they're not homeless and they don't have drug issues. Um, some of them have drug issues and are homeless, but, um, in Hartford, what the observation was that many of these people were dropped off every day, you know, in a pretty nice car. And so it, it's a very complicated issue. Um, yeah. I just well, wanted I to, that, um, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say um, that I think it's also uh, possible to speak about these two issues separately. Mm -hmm. um, because regardless of what may or may not be hand, happening with panhandlers who may or may not actually be making decent incomes and who may or may not be homeless, there is still the issue of homelessness in Hartford. Right. So, um, Erica, I know that you were going to talk about some of the things that the town is involved in, but I just wanna make that distinction because it may help speak directly to your concern, Alex. Yep instead of muddying the waters. And I don't mean, that sounded terrible. Um, no. Instead of combining two issues that may need to be tackled Separate. separately. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that um, we are seeing this become, um, you know, definitely at the forefront of a lot of conversations. We um, definitely started a conversation with, um, West Hartford, I know you shared um, resources that West Hartford had, um, had developed. We are actually in a task force with them right now that just started this year and not too long ago. And we're hoping to meet in person to discuss this as a regional approach because we, we, we understand and we realize that 
A lot of these individuals are going from town to town um, across the borders. So it really would be important to have a regionalized approach on how we're handling um, this topic. We had a presenter that came to our initial meeting, which actually was in person over the summer so we could space out. And it was the homeless outreach worker who is a police officer in Hartford. Yeah. And it was incredible. What's his um, name, Erica? Oh, Jim, it's, I think it's Jimmy, Jim Barrett. Jimmy Barrett. Yes, I've yeah. met him. He is a remarkable, a remarkable man and officer. Yeah, Sorry absolutely. for that interruption. No, no, that's perfect. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say. And the work that he is doing is phenomenal. And he has the success stories to share um, from like start to, to end on some of these, these cases. And I think that is the critical point there is having, um, dedicating staff to work with this, with these issues. Um, right now we don't have dedicated staff who can do that outreach work, who can be there, go out to those, um, you know, encampments or under those bridges, or even just into the parking lots where there are a lot of panhandling and talk, to um, these individuals about what they need, what they're lacking, how can we assist the resources connecting them? Um, we just don't have staff to do that in Weathersfield. And the conversation has started with some of the town council, the mayor, the town manager of how can we put this into place? And I know the new chief that just came on board, he's from Hartford. And he, I shared how impressed I was with the homeless outreach um, police officer. And he said, it's incredible the work he does. Um, so to have something like that here in Weathersfield is ideal. And we, we started discussing this in some of the ARPA funding. Um, like how do we use that money to kind of meet this need that's, that's coming here in town and to connect these individuals um, to the appropriate resources and figure out what exactly is going on to the best of our ability. Um, so I just want to let you know that it is at the forefront and it's it's on the top of the discussions. Um, the chief and I definitely put a proposal together for the town um, regarding ARPA funding to hire a staff to be a clinical staff, but also do a lot of this outreach work. And homeless was definitely one of the, uh, and panhandling was one of the criteria on what we think would would be needed for this position to fill. I well, like that idea. Can, sorry. I like the idea West Hartford had of it informing the public, you know, not to give them money, but to give them, you know, goods, because it's likely it hired go somebody through. as well West right. to do this work. Well, you know, there um, the days in down on Airport Road um, was recent, and I'm trying to think it, it was recently purchased by I don't know if it was Open Hearth or was that who bought it, Erica, or Open Hearth. Um, I'm not sure if it was open heart, but they're they're converting it into a shelter, right? They're converting it into yeah, into a shelter. And you know, the thought is that um, with the pandemic, they've had to do a run the shelters entirely differently. And the other thing that they can, you know, I kept looking at the nursing home on Jordan Lane and kept thinking this would make perfect um, supportive housing for people who are homeless. Though I understand the building is a disaster and they're probably going to tear it down. But I think that that's kind of the model that's being looked at is you, it's not just you get people off the street for the night, you put them up, you, you have some sort of <clears throat> supportive housing and you, you put the services in place and you move them on out. Yes, yes, having them have a roof over their head while they're, while they're trying to wrap resources on them is critical. Um, I know during the pandemic, actually Comfort Inn in Weathersfield was one of the locations where they um, had, uh, they decompressed some of the shelters and placed them there. Um, so that was housing shelter residents for, uh, for a while during the pandemic. Um, and it seemed to be going well. Um, al although they did have shelter staff that was, you know, manning like the floors there and, and still working um, for the residents. But the, the concept was, was great. And I think to move forward and replicate that going is, is would be incredible. Um, and working with 211, because we bring up often as social services, we, we often deal with residents who are going to be evicted and are, might be, you know, couch surfing or moving from one house to another house. 
And a lot of times those are not deemed as homeless because they technically mm -hmm. have somewhere to mm -hmm. be. And that mm -hmm. definition needs to change tremendously because we need to be proactive uh, um, when people are first, you know, getting eviction notices or even before that, when they're, you know, a behind on a month of rent, we need to be working with them then because once it gets to the point where they're truly homeless, it takes so much more resources and work to, to get them to where they need to be to sustain, you know, any type of quality of life. Yeah, I guess that was my kind of answer to my question that I was going to ask, but there are so many families that I work with in my role that are like, they're not visibly homeless, you know, standing on the side of the street, but, you know, are in danger of losing their housing or have been chronically homeless for years and have been gone from place to place, um, which might be something that needs to be addressed by social services, but not necessarily by a police officer. Um, so it, it sounds like that will be part of the proposal that you and the chief are working on. Okay. Thank it was you. actually a clinical staff to work within the P with the PD and social and um, youth and senior services. And we see that a lot, exactly what you're talking about, Carolyn, um, with, you know, the motels and the hotels on uh, the Berlin Turnpike and then the Comfort Inn in Motel 6. There's, there's definitely individuals and families that are living there um, mm -hmm. for long periods of time and it's not stable, you know, sufficient housing. But when we try to get them resources, because the hub of all types of housing has to go through 211 right now, and I'm sure you're aware of that. So you have to call them and it's, you know, the connections they connect through, you know, shelter diversion and getting a case manager and getting them into shelters. It's a whole process. But a lot of times if they have somewhere where they're staying currently, they don't consider it homeless yet. And we struggle with that. It's kind of like my clients who are trying to get clean and sober, they have to get, they have to use so they can go into the emergency room and get referred. I, I mean, I, I, I've had to tell clients, go out and drink. It's crazy. Erica, do you, do you see um, somewhere down the line um, a place for this commission to do something creative and helpful on this issue? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that multiple commissions in town should be involved in those efforts. And will you keep us updated on what that might be and how we can? Yeah, absolutely. You know, collaborate. Mm -hmm. Alex, thank you for bringing it up in the email initially. And look forward to uh, getting some new updates. Absolutely. Did, did you have any other questions, Alex, that I, that wasn't covered? No, that pretty much covered it. Okay. Okay. Um, and very briefly, because I know we've got two other things to do and it's getting late, but, um, but part, of, part of my last email was just asking if anybody had thoughts about how we set our agenda. Does anyone, does anyone have, um, well, let me be blunt. Does anybody have an interest in, um, group input into each month's agenda? Well, I, I think if, if someone has, has something that they want to put on the agenda, they just email you, Deborah. It's not, or, I mean, and or the, thing, the, other, the other thing is with the agenda is, is you can just have a basic agenda. And at the beginning of any meeting, if someone has an issue they want to raise, you just amend the agenda. The agenda is a roadmap, it's a tool. It's not, it's not a gate. Okay. Well, to be honest with you, the reason that I had sent that out and that I wanted to raise it here is because as a first time chair of anything, I want to make sure that um, that I don't have undue influence on what is discussed. So I just want to make sure that the, that the floor is clear and open to everybody. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think that's very thoughtful and um, accommodating. And I would just say, um, if anytime anybody does want something on the agenda, which this group is wonderful with sharing information and via email, just make sure to send me an, um, an email regarding what you want on the agenda by like the week um, prior to our meeting. Thank you. And, and Barbara, have have... I think that... I'm sorry. 
No, I just was going to say that I have to have the agenda to be posted um, by the Friday prior to our meeting. Okay. And Barbara, I appreciate what you said. Um, and I know that the agenda can be expanded during the meeting, but very often we might want to bring, have things on the agenda and ask people to think about them before right. we gather. So, okay. Yeah. I'm a no very problem. liberal agenda person. <laughs> and I try to always put on there like new items so it gives the opportunity for a discussion to be had. Right, right. Um, well, the next thing on our agenda under continued and new business is an update and feedback on the Weathersfield Social Justice Coalition. Yeah, I just wanted to keep that on there because I know it kind of intertwines with kind of the work of this commission as well. Um, they're still meeting. We actually are going in person again. So I wanted to share that with the group. Um, it's gonna actually be a hybrid approach. So a lot of people wanna come in person, but you are able to log in as well. We, it will be held at the high school going forward because they have the capability of doing remote and in person at the same time through different um, classrooms in the building. So actually the next meeting is full coalition meeting is tomorrow night. Um, so you can register to uh, log on remotely or you can actually be in person. Um, and there will be focus on um, breaking into subcommittee groups as well. So I know some members here belong to some of those subcommittee groups. So just, uh, this is just a, from, uh, just a reminder to join if you would like and to participate in the meetings and uh, we would love to to hear from the, the members of this commission. And that reminds me that I'm on the subcommittee for um, community outreach and policing, which may tie in in the future into um, offering some training opportunities. So we'll be able to work together on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, the next thing is social media and outreach. Carolyn, any updates? Uh, our Facebook's page is still posting. Um, they updated the format on me, so I'm probably going to have to spend a little time editing some stuff. Um, you were going to send me a new calendar, Deborah, but I hadn't received it from you, so I didn't know if okay. you and Erica had a chance to get it approved. I actually sent photos of each month's page. Did those not get through to you? It was a while ago. I haven't I received anything. I'll try it again see, this evening. Okay, great. I didn't see that as well, I don't believe, but I, I'll double check my email, Deb. Well, if neither one of you saw it, it's very possible that I hit delete instead of send. <laughs> I've been known to do that. So um, um, I, I'll take care of it this evening when we're, when we're finished. Great. Okay. I think it should be a problem. Deborah, I should put you yeah. in charge of my email. Maybe I, I thin it out. <laughs> well, that's what I've done with mine lately. Um, what you'll see, uh, Carolyn, when you get this, mm -hmm. and, and you will get it, um, is that the new calendar that I was telling you about actually has something posted for every day of every month. And I do not mean to overload <laughs> you. And I don't know how you might want to go through that and make a decision, but take a look and then let me know. Okay. Okay. Um, I just think it's another good tool. And you'll copy it to Erica so she can approve Yes, absolutely. Them Great. Absolutely. Um, other than that, we finished our posts for Black History Month. It's Women's History Month now. So I did a introductory <coughs> post, but if you have any resources or um, anything that you want me to share out for Women's History Month, please feel free to send an email. Um, I don't think there's anything else to update. We have 281 followers now, so. Woo. We keep moving Woo. up, you know, incrementally. So um, feel free to share to your um, friends on Facebook so that it gets out to the wider community. Um, we do try to amplify the posts from, you know, the food bank or anything um, that might have relevance, you know, kind of mm -hmm. as a human rights issue, but also as a town issue as well. So um that's about it for thank, right you, now. thank you, Miss Carolyn, for your hard work. Yes. No problem. I just haven't had time. But I'll, I'll probably find stuff to send because we still have enough of the month left for Women's History Month and happy belated International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. um, 
Every day is International Women's Day. Oh, I said that to my mom yesterday, but it doesn't hurt to have a special day yeah. where <laughs> women have an occasion and the men that support us and believe in the strength of women and their mothers and their sisters and their nieces and their daughters and everyone else. Um, and it's also important to, to celebrate it because there's a lot of history there that came, a lot of people sacrificed and worked hard to have the recognition. So that's wonderful. But I want to say thank you to Miss Carolyn and Miss Erica. Every time I send stuff, they take the time to look through it. Um, yep. So I want to say thank you very much. Also, I know this is out of order, but um, that tackle training, if anybody's interested, I believe I, uh, uh, Myra said that if anybody's interested, they need to sign up by tomorrow. So I sent the email to Erica as we were conversing with the link for it, if anyone's interested in um, that, because it seems anything that's free and educational, I'm all about sharing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it looks great and we can post it. Yeah, that because would be I great. figured, you know, yeah, so I sent it there and I also asked to Erica being presumptuous, share it with the town counselors. <laughs> you never know if they may have, they may want to attend some of it because it looks, I mean, the overview looks really good in terms of what the goal is and educating. So that's all cool. And if perhaps somebody from this commission was able to go through it, we would, we would be on more solid ground when we asked perhaps someone from our police department to consider attending in the future. It would be nice to know exactly mm. what it is that we're asking other people to participate in. So I'll check out the dates. Thank you. Other business? I just have one thing, Deb, if you don't mind. Um, Not at all. That town, um, the town has been opening up to meeting in person. I just have to ask all the boards and commissions that I'm involved with um, what they would like to do in terms of being remote or going in person. Um, we have to choose one or the other. Um, and we can't do, uh, we can't go, you know, flip flop. We can't do a hybrid right as of right now. So we just have to make a decision as a group um, what we would like to do going forward. Our next meeting isn't, is anticipated for um, May. So just want to put that out there. I think we should have in-person meetings when the weather is nice and Zoom when it's not. <laughs> so in the winter, we should, we should be on Zoom and in the, in the spring and summer, we should be in person. That, that, that's a bit of a snippy comment, but <laughs> I kind of like it. <laughs> I like it, but we can't, we can't, we can't do, um, it has to either be all in person or all um, remote. Well, we could change our mind part way through, couldn't we? I'm still in favor of the remote meetings. Uh, <laughs> I I'm, cannot I'm... agree with that, Barbara, but <laughs> <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Okay, since you're asking the question, I would prefer continuing the way we are because that way I my odds of making all the meetings are greater. I don't know if that's the same for other that's folks. True. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a preference, really, um, but I would certainly, uh, I'll, I'll certainly go with the majority vote. Um, Zoom does have its its perks. Like none of the you know perk, what I'm wearing. None of yeah, you know what I'm perk, wearing. <laughs> yeah, I, well, the other perk it has right now, since the gas prices are going to go, are going up, yes. and they're probably going to go up higher because this conflict doesn't look like it's going to be resolved anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I w wish to be wrong. It saves us gas for all of us. Yvette, Alex, how do you feel about this? I like in-person meetings. I'm not a fan. Of well, you just muted yourself just also, muted. Alex. Yeah. Pretty decision. Yeah, we're Wait, trying you, to figure out You muted saying. yourself halfway through what you <laughs> were saying. I was getting a phone call. This is good. <laughs> can oh. you hear me? Yes. Now we can. Now okay. we do. Do you prefer in-person? I prefer in person. I'm not a, usually always getting an echo in the background or something going on, but I'll be happy to to continue with Zoom if everybody feels more comfortable with Zoom. Yvette? Uh, I just kind of having a very, very random schedule, um, just kind of like the other sentiment that it just for me personally, I it's much easier for me to be present when it's um, Zoom. Uh, so that would be my preference. 
It sounds like majority are going with Zoom. Mm -hmm. Right now, let's just say for right now, let's just okay. keep it that way. Um, I don't know if we if we need to necessarily take a formal vote because um, we kind of got the sense here. Is that okay with you, Alex? Yep, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. So we are right now continuing on Zoom, but I would love to schedule something like a retreat in the summer so we can get together, but we can talk about that at our main meeting, but it is something that I find to be very helpful. And it usually has to involve food. Absolutely. And drink. And beverages. One mm -hmm. of the yes. most fun meetings we ever had with the Youth Service Advisory Board was a June meeting where we brought a big salad bowl and everybody brought something to put in the salad. And it was, it was just amazing. Nobody brought the same thing. I mean, everybody brought something different. Interesting. Mm. It was unique. Okay. Well, it's eight, it's 815. Do we have more items? No, that's all I needed to get clarified. Um, just to okay. go back to the town, what we were doing for the time being. I move um, right now. Before we move there, I just <laughs> can do what I did at a different meeting is, can yeah. we have just a moment of silence for Ukraine. the children, the mothers, the fathers, the grandmothers, anyone I'm forgetting who is fleeing as we yes. speak. Mm -hmm. And I include in that the, Ukra the Russian people who are sitting, they're just sitting there not being able to do anything other than protest. And when they do, they get arrested. And God or knows what happens. They're trying when they're to find detained. out where their children are. Yes. Or parents who one is in Poland and the other went back and they don't know when they'll see each other, if they'll see each other again. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. Thank you, Maria, for, for thinking of doing that. Maria, I want you to know that partway through the day, my mother said she had enough of watching CNN. <laughs> uh, I can appreciate that, but I, I'm guilty. I do it in periods and then I stop. Today, I admit I actually, my alma mater, Fairfield, had a panel discussion on what's happening there. And it was, and that was okay. Um, but I can only do it in periods. And my mom is glued to the TV probably longer than she should be. And for those who don't know, my family is Cuban. So the whole refugee fleeing, not knowing family you leave, will you ever see them again? It's, it's a little deja vu to say the least. So that um, I feel the need to speak up and I'm, pick, and I'm talking about the Ukrainians because again, I don't like Russian government for lots of reasons. Um, they invade in many ways. Ukraine is the extreme example, but they're everywhere. They meddle where they shouldn't be. Um, so, but it, and please understand that it doesn't mean I don't care about the refugees elsewhere because there are plenty of them in Yemen and in other parts of the world. And the suffering is still the same. Doesn't matter what they look like, what they sound like, that experience is it's the club you never want to join is all I can right. say it's and the club Maria, you pray never to join and yes. Maria and I are a little bit of a tag team on this from the other meeting my mother fled the <laughs> Russians my grandmother lived under Russian occupation and um I think I think my brother and I think my mother's been watching CNN because she wants to make sure the Russians aren't coming and yesterday she told us we had to go to the grocery store and stock up on lots of canned goods <sighs> Yeah, my grandfather used to say that he used to buy green beans. And I remember asking him as a kid, why are you buying green beans? We don't even eat green beans. He said, because you never know. Right. Yeah. Trauma yeah. moves on. Trauma, trauma keeps going, even after the event. Yeah. Gener there's generational <laughs> trauma. Right. Yeah. And, if that, and if that wasn't here on a lighter note, just to make it a little lighter. My husband is half Lithuanian. Okay. The reason I mentioned that is my mom 
obviously would have preferred if I married in the community, if you will, but I didn't. But the first thing she said is, oh, good. He's Catholic and, and I know where they are and they don't like the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Barbara, do you want to make your motion atheist, again? But... Okay, I move we adjourn. Okay, so it's 819. Need a second. Second. Any second? Who seconded? I did. Thank you, Carolyn. The school day starts early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. And our Thank next you. meeting is May 11th. Via Zoom. Via Zoom, correct. <laughs> okay. That's All right. right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alex, for raising that issue. Yes. We all see every day as we drive yeah. by. And right. it's like the issue you look at and you're like, what do you do? We'll talk more. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye, all.